We're going to talk a little bit about the larger rotator cuff tears or the ones that doesn't seem like it will hold up if we do put them together. We all know that there's a fairly significant historical literature on open and now arthroscopic approaches that have, if you image them, have persistent defects. Some people like to say it's a recurrent defect because patients can't imagine that they didn't heal. So then it's, of course, they've developed a tear in their shoulder after a surgery. In some cases, though, most of us would admit that it probably didn't heal in the first place. Irreparable tears may be, as in this one here, where you put your sutures in and it's an unlikely pull to get the tendon to come to the tuberosity. A lot of people would like to argue whether you're doing single or double row. I think they're cases as in this case where you're not going to get, it doesn't matter what you do, the chances of that tendon surviving against that footprint is relatively poor. Over time, these are chroni chronic cases, or rarely do you get an acute tear, and when you do get an acute tear, almost always there's a stump of tissue left on the greater tuberosity. And so that in itself would define tissue loss, because if the stump is on the tuberosity and your tear is medial to the stump, now you're really creating an unnatural situation. And watch your videos as people are starting to do the instructive videos with double row, and they're putting their devices in and grasping the supraspinatus. Often they're grasping at only two or three millimeters from the muscle tendon junction of the supraspinatus, because it has a relatively short stump. Well, that same muscle tendon junction lives under the AC joint, doesn't live anywhere near the greater tuberosity. So you can imagine, I don't care what releases we're talking about, that's probably gonna be inadequate to get it to live there and still be viable. So tissue losses, tissue retraction, when the humeral head starts getting superior migration, that's kind of the, uh, the end stage for us. Do not judge this by an MRI where a patient's supine. Judge this by an upright X-ray and if the humeral head is approaching the acromium, that would suggest that this is a story, the horse is out of the barn. Anterior subluxation, the same way it could go superiorly, it could go anteriorly with subscapularis failure, and that too is a fixed deformity with uh, most people looking at reverse shoulder orthoplasty as one of the only ways to salvage that situation. So along comes other ways to deal with tissue defect. One is a biological product. I had something to do with this. This was a matter of taking the tendon above. The tendon above is a patient, workman's comp, who had surgery already, had some degree of healing, but has a defect in the tendon, and also there's a, on the MRI, a sort of an intertendinous split. So it's a, it, it run, there's an articular surface, a bursal surface, and the piece in the middle is missing. And so to me, it seems very backwards to think about taking everything down and then trying to see whether or not it'll survive another operation. So this was an onlay graft. This was a biologically active graft. That's how it looks like in the lower left-hand corner. And follow-up MRI, because it was in a study, did suggest that the interlaminar portion filled in with the with the graft on the surface. So this was a non-structural graft. This is more of trying to trigger biologics, and I don't have a lot of luck with PRP and stem cells. In fact, I really didn't go down that road much at all. I don't know what the discussions earlier were on these type of things, but in the shoulder, it's a bit disappointing. It is not happening yet, but it, stay tuned. I think stem cells may have a place. We just don't have the, the right information to help people along. So you get these type of shoulders where the humeral head creates an acetabulum with the acromium, and that would suggest that superior migration has been there for quite a while. You'd like to be there before this happens, before there's irreparable type of damage where your only option is either to live with it or to consider uh, a reverse shoulder replacement to bring the humeral head down or utilize the tissue. So when you're dealing with these large and massive tears, you got a couple different options. You have a non-operative option, and this should be probably where most people are because for the, the truth of the matter is, most patients do have minimally symptomatic rotator cuff tears. If you think about it, we probably only operate on less than 10% of rotator cuff tears. Uh, that does, that's not 10% of the patients visiting you, but if you look at the, mor the morbidity studies with people post-mortem getting autopsies, there's a far greater number of people with rotator cuff tears that probably have never seen a physician. And when you ask your patients who are 80 years old to raise their hands all the way, and they go like, well, this is the one that hurts, and then here's the one that doesn't hurt, 
they probably got a relatively similar anatomy on both sides. And they, they don't have their full elevation, but they don't recognize it as a problem. So arthroscopically, you can conquer some of these patients' symptoms by just dealing with the biceps. Others will have partial repairs, and we'll talk a little bit about superior capsule graft reconstructions and then adding grafts. From an open perspective, there is the tendon transfers that become compelling because if you can make it a dynamic process rather than a static process, maybe there has a bigger role for that. Left out on that slide would be an arthroscopic placement of a balloon. We'll probably see a little bit more of that, but that's an absorbable product. It's hard to know where that's gonna go. And then of course, reverse total shoulder orthoplasty, which is exciting for a person who has these massive irreparable tears, really is starting to have osteoarthritis or uh, cuff tear arthropathy, and you could well position the head, and clearly that's an option that we did not have before. Fusions are pretty rare. When I get together and talk about irreparable tears, it reminds me here that sometimes the irreparable tear doesn't have to be a massive tear. This is an isolated supraspinatus. This tear, uh, Rob Bell used to call a box top repair. It's really a tear. It's really just the supraspinatus, but again, it's fixed, it's retracted immediately, and it's gonna have a hard time surviving. So even, it doesn't have to be necessarily the size that goes along with irreparable. It can also just be the degree of tissue loss and tissue retraction. What's the problem with the massive? The massive tear is a two tendon tear going on three, and it usually is the upper border of the subscap, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus would probably be the most common, but what is created is a boutonniere deformity similar to what you find in the hand. And if the humeral head migrates up, even the tendons that are not torn fall below the equator of the humeral head. So what used to be depressors of the humeral head during deltoid activity are no longer depressors, they're now adductors, adductors because the head has migrated up through the hole. So this would be the rationale for superior capsular grafts. This would be the rationale for balloons. If you can separate the humeral head from the acromium and push it down, the tendons that are not torn may be in a much more effective location to counter out the deltoid to avoid the so-called shrug or the anterior superior escape. When you start looking at who, which ones do you fix, well, here's a guy with a massive tear. He's a construction worker. He's in his upper 40s. There's individuals, they don't all have to be elderly and they don't all have to have acute injuries, although many times an acute event precipitates the visit. So realize that there's active motion loss, there's limitations, and you really should be speaking to your patient about goals. And then often when we're dealing with these, which we have a better chance of helping them with pain, we're not always making them stronger. In fact, probably half the time we're not. You have to take into case the, the social situation. Here's a little elderly woman, and she has painful elevation, she has a chronic massive tear, and clearly she's in trouble. Now, she lives alone, she's a widower, so are you gonna put her through a sling for six weeks in therapy where she can't even drive herself to therapy? Probably not. So here's her biceps, and this is her after her biceps tenotomy. She's able to lift her arm, and what, all she got was a debridement, a modified decompression. So there's also partial repairs. Now these are not as exciting to us. We, we try to get full repairs, but if you could get the subscapularis done in front and you get the infraspinatus in the back, there's a chance that uh, you can still create some degree. Remember I said it's a two to three tendon tear to allow the boutonniere deformity. If you can narrow the hole and it'll stay narrow with only the supraspinatus missing, you have a chance that you may be able to functionally improve the shoulder. So this is at least a partial goal and I'll give you one extra tip a little later in the talk on how this may become more viable to your practice. Here's a 76 year old professor at Princeton University, he wants to play his golf. He can't really bring his arm up very well. He does not have an arthritic shoulder, but he does not want a, mass, a big time operation. And he gets the partial tear where the subscap, the infraspinatus gets put together, has good rotation. And this is one of the reasons I don't know that you're gonna get the good rotation if you do a reverse shoulder orthoplasty. So if his goal when he's not in front of a classroom is to play golf and rotation's a major factor, I don't know that the reverse gets it for it done. Why does the partial work? Well, Steve Burkhardt popularized the bridge where anteriorly adjacent to the biceps is the anterior cable to the rotator cuff, and the posterior is at the infraspinatus supraspinatus junction, a little bit more around the corner. The crescent, we can deal with a tear very nicely, but if those cables get displaced or torn, then all of a sudden your shoulder becomes less stable and re doesn't resist upward migration when your deltoid fires. So the picture on your left is a subscap 
step repair, the picture on your right, your infraspinatus. You could look at the picture on the right, realize that that supraspinatus is probably going to be a deficiency, and you can either graft it, you can leave it alone, or you can use tissues uh, from the patient's shoulder to try to cover it. But all you're really trying to do is create a, uh, cover the hole if you do. So in this particular case, I, I started using the biceps. I took the biceps out, and I would take the stump or the piece of tissue and actually close the hole. So I do my best with the supraspinatus, and then the picture on the right shows the biceps coming across from a posterior view where I have it sewn to the anterior anchor, which is tina deist, and the free two inches of biceps then sewn into the infraspinatus posteriorly and basically creating a coverage of the defect, uh, re putting some collagen down without basically sacrificing or needing to put a foreign tissue in the shoulder. And this is what this operation may look like. So right shoulder, lateral decubitus, biceps to your left, subscap to your right. I'm on both sides of the biceps. I'm putting a stitch in through my anterior portal that's in front of the interval, lateral to the coracochromial ligament, and then I'm going to take a cautery and basically divide the biceps. I'm going to bring it out, and you can see it pulls up on the subscap and it pulls on the anterior margin of the supraspinatus, at least the interval tissue that's combined with it. I'm now in the subacromial space, posterior viewing portal. My third stitch from my anterior anchor will go through the biceps. The other two went through the supraspinatus. One is a mattress, one is a simple suture. And now I'm going to bring the biceps over the top. As I'm tying it, I'll release the traction suture. And then I take the free edge of the biceps and sew it into the infraspinatus. So I basically create a capital A with the tendon going across. I take that last stitch and I bring it over the top to a knotless anchor. I don't know that you need that extra anchor. Basically, you get it done with a tenodesis and then a coverage, and it bridges the defect. Durability, young, you want to keep track of people, surveillance, have them come back to you even after they've been discharged. You could ultrasound them if they've had a traumatic event and you want to know early. Elderly, you go by their functional range of motion. So active elevation and see if they get back to their activities. Keep an eye on arthritis since many of them have it to start with. Here's an individual who lives on a boat. He's the cook, he's the captain, and he takes people out so I don't get to see him much. But basically, here's his follow-up from his partial cuff repair and his biceps tendon transfer. I've now seen him for about seven years after his surgery, so that would be his pictures. Revision surgery. Now you're going to get your patients who come in and they've been fixed by yourself or someone down the street. They come in and they have a failed cuff repair. Well, this is not so optimistic. If it fails one surgery, what makes you think you're going to go in and do something that's going to turn this all around? So you better have a different plan. They're often there for pain management issues, and it's sometimes you have to be aware that P. acnes can be the reason for failure, which means you don't want to walk into that environment, and it's not a purulent shoulder, so again, that becomes a tough diagnosis sometimes to make. But you want to basically release and move the shoulder. The strength returns are not so good, but here's one of the reasons I use a superior capsular graft if the environment looks like it's acceptable. This is now a structural graft. Sometimes I can use it to reinforce the cuff. Sometimes I can use it to cover the defect. So here, we just, uh, this is a recent case. An individual is a chiropractor in my town. He basically had a stiff shoulder. I did a single release. I did not go forward with his operation. I cleaned him up and I brought him back six weeks later. I did not want to one stage a superior capsule graft. I will one stage a repair. Take the adhesions out, go on and do the repair. If I'm putting a big piece of non-viable tissue in the shoulder, I don't think that's a great idea. So do your releases, get his full range of motion back, then start working on this. I put three sutures, two anchors medially, one in through the superior labrum, and pulled on that stitch to actually draw the, the tendon in. Those of you who are struggling pulling the meniscus in, it's easier to pull it in than push it in. So have a stitch pulling your uh, leading edge in. And now I'm just basically, I'll stuff the free edge of the graft between the glenohumeral joint. So the tail end doesn't keep flopping up in the way. You tuck it down, you do your medial fixation, and then you could start doing your more lateral fixation after you finished your medial sutures. Put your medial anchors in first. 
And then once you start getting to the place where you have a couple stitches medially and a couple stitches laterally, you could go through the infraspinatus and do some reconstruction. You could do your tail end of your graft, which basically could go to knotless anchors either around the corner or I actually go on the lateral aspect of the graded tuberosity to create that, uh, the flat surface. And that would be a lateral view of your graft. Really work on your infraspinatus graft juncture. I think that that's a big part of trying to reestablish function. This is what he looks like. He's not great, but he's better. His external rotation on his left is a little bit less, no surprise, but he has external rotation. And I think if you would have gone to something that ignored his infraspinatus, I'm not sure you would have got it done without doing something, especially those delaminations in the infraspinatus. You better get to the deep layers. You could almost always close the superficial layer of the infraspinatus, but if you don't get the deep tissue together, you're going to lose active range of motion. Tendon augmentation. So here's a shoulder that has been repaired, the picture on your left, but is very thin. And so rather than take it down and see what you, that you could do something much better, an onlay graft a la Steve Snyder style would be something to consider. Basically, you go in, you put some sutures medially or where you think the tendon or the muscle tendon junction is. You put your onlay graft on top. You don't need uh, to do much more than four or five points of fixation. It's not to how many sutures you put in. It's more about where you put them. And that's the medial sutures, again, near the muscle tendon junction. And then you go laterally. You can, again, do a little bit more work where it jumps to the infraspinatus. I think that... Rotator cuff. The future, of, we all talk about biologics as the sort of the term. I don't think the cellular biologics has come through. The PRP has not made a major impact on what's going on. The stem cells may, but if you realize that you're talking about something that's going to be in the system a matter of hours, not days, but hours, forget about weeks and months, and you need something for weeks and months, it doesn't seem like we're riding on the right horse on this thing. So I think it's gonna come in a graft fashion. Now, whether the graft becomes impregnated with cells one day, your cells, where you mix the two, that may turn out to be a better option. But right now, I think for closing a deficient area or reinforcing a thin piece of tissue, it's probably gonna be an onlay graft of some kind. Whether you put the graft under the intact or the portion of the cuff or you put it on top, Here's how I work it. If I could bring the rotator cuff over to the tuberosity, but I can't cover the footprint, it's just a medial repair, I'll put an onlay graft over the top and carry it around the corner so it, is, it has good footprint coverage. If on the other hand, I really can't successfully bring the tendon to the tuberosity, then I'm either using the biceps to bridge it or I'm doing a superior capsular graft reconstruction, and sometimes I'm actually combining both of them where I use the biceps as the leading edge of the superior capsular graft.